Hi there, and welcome to Enterprise Software Innovators, a show where top technology executives share how they innovate at scale. In each episode, enterprise CIOs share how they've applied exciting new technologies and what they've learned along the way. I'm Sam Motamidi, a general partner at Greylock Partners. And I'm Evan Reiser, the CEO and founder of Abnormal Security. Today on the show, we bring you a conversation with Sandeep Dave, Chief Digital and Technology Officer at CBRE. CBRE is a Fortune 500 commercial real estate company with $27 billion of revenue and more than 100,000 employees around the world. In this conversation, Sandeep shares fascinating insights into CBRE's innovative uses of technology, including augmented reality solutions for technicians, their venture into consumer-facing applications, and AI capabilities that reinvent the commercial real estate experience. Sandeep, thanks so much for making time to chat with us. So maybe just to kick us off, Sandeep, do you want to share a little bit about the background on kind of CBRE generally, maybe your role there? Yeah, so CBRE is the world's largest commercial real estate services investment brokerage firm. So essentially, we help our clients through the entire life cycle of commercial real estate, from finding space, whether it's buying or leasing, building the space out, managing that space, and then even real estate as an alternate investment class. And we are global. We are a Fortune 150. We operate in over 100 countries. We process 500 billion in transaction volume. We manage close to 7 billion square feet. So it's a pretty significant operation. And in my role as Chief Digital and Technology Officer, I oversee all aspects of technology for the company, from digital strategy to enabling technology for the segments that we report in our venture investments, our partnerships, and then the traditional CIO function as well, cybersecurity, financial systems, so on and so on. One of the things that Sam and I've really enjoyed about the show is we get to hear like these really unique ways that people are using technology that may not be fully appreciated. So of course, I have to ask you, maybe you can share some of the ways that CBRE is using technology in ways that maybe an outsider would not expect or might surprise the average person that wasn't super familiar with your business. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I will maybe give a little broader context and then I'll click into that example, which is really interesting. So obviously, the term metaverse was really in vogue recently until AI took over. <laughs> but what we said is that, well, what is a real world application? And working with our technology partners, we said, well, it's the industrial metaverse. At least that's relevant for us. And the industrial metaverse for us was the combination of the digital and the physical worlds. And how do you deploy IoT at scale, capture data in addition to IoT and sensors, but also from traditional BMS systems? to generate analytics in real time, to take corrective action, to run predictive analytics. And in that scope of what we call the industrial metaverse, we also came into this problem where the built world is going through this transition where, especially for complex assets, such as life science labs or hospitals, the technician talent and the knowledge pool of the technician talent is reducing. And so we actually applied augmented reality technology, so HoloLens capability to apply four eyes in the field. So you would have a more junior technician in the field, but you would have more experienced technician behind the scenes, seeing what the person is seeing, guiding them through what changes they, or what the diagnostic is, and what they should be doing as a result. It's live. It's live with 20 clients, and it's being used, and clients are asking for it. So it's an interesting application that potentially is surprising for your listeners. We had this guest on the other week who was talking about kind of smart buildings. And he said, hey, smart buildings, like people kind of know that you build that kind of more modern materials, right? You'd kind of better manage HVAC. So like the extent in which these technologies are being used are not fully understood. And he gave an example where in some of their office buildings, they installed motion sensors right in every room. They would automatically control the shades to make sure that it was a more consistent temperature over time. And that was really impressive to me because I was like, I just, you don't appreciate that, right? It's like a user of that product. Like, are there any other examples where of kind of the way technology might work in real estate that you know, people would be pressed by or surprised by or might kind of be otherwise hidden? Yeah, and see, smart buildings itself is an interesting topic because smart buildings have been around forever. This concept is not new. But what has happened so far is that smart buildings, everybody had this trophy building to showcase. And then the rest of the portfolio was, let's call it dumb buildings, right? Until now, where there is this combination of both technology that's available at scale, but also the need, which is driven by the fact that 39% of 
greenhouse gas emissions are contributed by real estate. And there's a real desire to address that as a problem. Where today, what we do is we deploy smart buildings at scale. We not only, yes, there's this interesting sensor technology, but the ability to ingest data in any and all form, whether that's live streaming or batch processing from sensors to BMS systems to just batch, and then analyze it, land it in a consistent data model, run analysis, and take corrective action to manage the build environment at a portfolio level and not just at a one building level is where we are actually moving the needle for our clients and for the build environment. I think maybe to follow up because I really love these examples and I think the smart buildings is a really interesting set. The other thing you referenced, and by the way, I love the phrase industrial metaverse. When Evan and I first started the show, the metaverse was really in vogue and we were just asking every guest, like, help us understand how this impacts our lives. And I think the way you described it as a really, really good and concrete example. So I just want to unpack that a little bit more and tie that to what your commentary on the talent side. And I think it's a common thing across industries where labor markets are tight. It's hard to find people for the right roles and get those people productive quickly. And a key application of technology is to help accelerate and solve that problem. How have you all done that with technicians and maybe expand on that example for a few minutes? Yeah, I think this one particular example that we were talking about where obviously we invest in training, we do it in a few different ways. One is where we try to ensure that we have the right information, the knowledge base, the right information at the right time is made available to our technicians. The second thing that we've done is we have focused on this three outcomes for our clients, efficiency, energy, and experience in the workplace. And in that particularly focused on efficiency and energy, we are focused on remote diagnostic and virtual maintenance, which is that rather than a technician always having to be dispatched, then showing up at the site, doing a diagnostic, then going back and saying, these are the paths that I need, then going back and taking another trip and saying, now let me go fix it. How do we actually generate enough insight so that the technician knows what they're going to solve? or in some cases, even virtually solve it. So remote diagnostic, virtual maintenance. And then, of course, the other example that I was referring to, which is in really complex environments, how do you leverage somebody with expertise who can use augmented reality to support the more junior technician in the field? And Sandeep, that's a lot different the way the world worked like 10 years ago, right? We're on this kind of great curve of technology where that's going to be even more impressive. We help us like look into that future a little bit, right? What does your industry look like 10 years from now? And how is technology going to change your business? And what does it mean for real estate? What are the implications for your customers? Yeah. And Evan, maybe one of the things that you said in terms of something's not changed in 10 years, that triggered a thought. And I'd love to share another interesting application of technology where we've actually pushed the boundaries for CBRE as well. When we did our strategy exercises, and we often look at what are the trends, how is the industry changing, is there disruption? One of the things that we had noticed is that while a lot of the conversation was around agile workspaces, the hidden trend was around employee experience. And if you think about how our lives have changed, the way we order food, the way we hail a cab, that's all dramatically changed and made available in the palm of our hand. But the workspaces have remained the same, except, yes, it may be a different look and feel. It's more of an open seating environment. But inherently, people are still, one example is people tend to get creative around how you name conferences. You name them around cities or artwork. Or in our workspace, we've named it around interesting technology. And then people are looking around saying, well, where exactly is this conference room? So we notice this trend. And we said we are going to focus on employee experience. And one of our clients at the time, interestingly, such was the timing that they released an RFP saying we're going to rethink the experience in the workplace, create something next generation. But we are not going to include CBRE in the RFP process because CBRE is not really that next generation company. And we had just started our digital transformation. And what we told that company is that, well, you can define next generation the old way which is reams of documentation through an RFP process, or we can get all get into a room through a design thinking session for two days. And we did exactly that. We got everybody together. And after two days, we walked away with a clickable prototype. And the client was just wowed. 
And that employee experience capability, which we call CBRE host, actually has pivoted so many times. And in startup world, we talk about product market fit and product pivots. We had that experience focused on next generation. Then came COVID. We made it a communications tool. Then came a return to work, and we made it a return to work tool. It is live in 700 buildings with logos and clients that you would recognize in 25 plus countries. And it was the first consumer facing application for CBRE. And it's just dramatic in terms of the impact that it has had. Well, wow, that's a great story. Cause I imagine again, like 10 years ago, you probably wouldn't have imagined like, hey, part of the job here is to go create consumer applications. I'm sure most people outside your business, right, wouldn't realize, right, that's some of the work you guys are doing. It was completely new muscle for us. So then maybe your question around how is the world of real estate changing? Let me just get my crystal ball. No. <laughs> okay, can I borrow that when you're done as well? Because I like yeah. this. <laughs> Who knows, right? I think the one thing that we know is that the industry is not going to be as manual as it is today. All the leases and invoices and all the paper documentation that happens today, we are already applying ML models in many different ways. And now with generative AI, those models are going to get even better in terms of abstracting and unlocking value. I suspect that we see tremendous value there. In terms of how we make decisions around investing, a lot of the decisions historically used to be, well, here is the broad trend and here is the market. And so let's invest in that broad trend in the market. Whereas that investments are going to be extremely micro in the future, where it's about this specific property and here is the exact value of that property because we know so much more. And we've applied technology, AI ML models to improve our understanding. And then we spoke about smart buildings or digital twins, industrial metaverse. I think this, we are starting to scratch the surface on remote diagnostic, remote maintenance. But I fully see 10 years from now, the likelihood of this concept of self-healing buildings where they're much better managed with less human intervention. And the humans are doing a lot more productive work than they do today. So we'll see. 10 years from now, we can come back and discuss whether any of this was right or wrong. I can see that because you're already talking about kind of virtual maintenance and kind of self-diagnosis. And so like that is, I should imagine that that trend goes more towards this kind of like self-healing concept. Although you said the magical words for me and uh, Sam, which are AI, which is kind of the businesses we're both in. So yeah, Sam, any, I'm sure you're itching to ask a follow-up question here around some of the AI or kind of generative model type topics. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, as Evan, as you're saying that, I was thinking like, over the course of the show, we've seen this transition from early days, everyone was talking about the metaverse, and now everyone's talking about AI and generative AI in particular. And that joke aside, like I think both Evan and I believe that a lot of computing is going to change with these generative models and their emergent capabilities. Sandeep, if you were to take your most techno-optimist hat and think through, like, given the capabilities we see with things like ChatGPT and GPT-4 and DALI applied to real estate and the buildings we work in and the way the whole real estate life cycle happens, like, how might these things get transformed? And like, if we knew what would happen in five years, we would be like, wow. Yeah, it's such an exciting time and the potential seems to be tremendous how much the technology has matured. Now, we apply AI ML in many different ways. We discussed some of that in our conversation so far, abstracting unstructured documents, anomaly detection, predictive analytics. But that's more what we've got used to. Obviously, no one even talks about call center support and chatbots and all of that. But I think that the productivity benefit from generative AI technology is going to be just tremendous. A lot of the time that our brokers spent on is in marketing properties. I mean, just the fact that you could probably cut 50, 60, 70% of that time by leveraging some of these capabilities. And that's not even far away. That's probably more here and now. Maybe a little bit more far away is one of the things that we often talk about is that property selection is getting increasingly digital and increasingly immersive. Today, we have technology where in a two-dimensional environment or in a three-dimensional rendering, we are able to show that, well, here are three or four different patterns. Like, Would you prefer a contemporary setup or a more warm, organic setup? And here is how the 
fitting would look like. Now, imagine just designing a space, designing a building through construction and saying that, well, I want it to have this ESG footprint and running multiple models through generative AI technologies. Then creating a visual digital twin of it and saying, well, here's how it could look. And these are the different ways that it could look. And then being inside the building to say, well, would you like it to look like this and see it in an immersive manner, not just on your browser, but to see it in an immersive manner. The possibilities are so tremendous. And there is clearly, I'm excited about it. <laughs> I actually kind of imagine that, right? Because someone that's leased office space before, it's very hard to imagine, even being there in person, it's hard to imagine, hey, what would it be like to actually work in there, right? Especially if it's not the right, you know, not the target configuration. So I can imagine the CBRE GPT, right? You say, hey, like given some floor plan, given some property, hey, like I want it to be like industrial modern. I want to set it up for like so much workplace. I want to make sure there's light over here. I want a kitchen and it kind of renders that out, right? It's like a digital model that's interactive. That's probably just much more efficient than the thousands of hours it might take to set things up or do renderings and have people travel to the office. That seems like a plausible future. Yeah, indeed. Maybe just like one more question on AI. Are there other examples of how you're applying AI technology or machine learning in ways that just other people might not expect today? Yeah. So I already spoke about some of the examples around abstracting unstructured documents where before it was completely manual. Now we are applying AI and that's unlocking a lot of productivity, anomaly detection, predictive analytics. But here's an interesting example. And the best AI is when it's just working in the background giving you simple prompts, and you don't realize, but it's making your life better. And we spoke about this CBRE host, the tool that the employee experience product that we were talking about. And everybody right now is focused on return to work. All the employers are thinking about, well, what are the amenities that I need and what is the environment that I need to create to bring people back to work? Well, what we say is that the most important amenity that the employee is looking for is another employee in the workplace. Because what ends up happening is that I show up to work to spend the whole day on video calls. And that then defeats the purpose of me being in the workplace. And so what we are trying to, the way we are trying to apply AI in this employee experience product is to prompt. So I would get a prompt saying, okay, well, Sandeep, you're planning to be in the workplace on Thursday. And that's a good day because based on the network that you interact with, and the meetings that you have, you are likely to have a productive working day in the office versus no, today is a good day to be at home. And then subtle prompts around, hey, 2 p.m. Thursdays, you typically have a conversation with Evan and Sam. And so would you like to schedule a meeting? So those are ways in which we are trying to make things better and changing that for the last 10 years, the workplace has not changed, but we are now slowly, slowly trying to change. I'd say like the examples you just walked through, both in terms of what's happening today and also the future, are some of the most exciting and illustrative of the impact this technology is going to have. One of the keys to being able to deliver these experiences, I want to shift kind of the focus to like internally, you as a leader and how you build your team and create the culture that fosters innovation. So talk about your approach as a technology and innovation leader inside the company and what distinguishes it. Yeah, I think... I'll highlight two things. One is that, and I've spent a lot of time in high tech, telecom, financial services, and I've sort of seen two models. And both models work depending on the what you're trying to solve for. But the one model that I've seen is where there are innovation labs, there is venture arm, there are investments, and you see a lot of innovation, but you don't transform the core business. And what we were very clear about is that we needed to transform the core business. There was a lot of interesting innovation, some of which we've spoken to. And there was a lot of just non-sexy, like I need to rationalize my ERPs and all of that. And that's the model we went after and it's working for us. So that's one. The other is we are very conscious. We've taken a build by partner approach where we've said that there are certain things that we will build because those are differentiating for us. We will buy, and that means licensing or acquisition, when there is a real opportunity or there is a commodity, licensing for commodity, acquisition for opportunity. And then we'll be very active in the prop tech, climate tech marketplace. And we were one of the first investors to incubate a prop tech venture capital 
six, seven years ago. We now have global coverage through our venture partners. And just by the sheer size of CBRE, we get a lot of exposure to interesting innovation. And we always try to form strategic partnerships with interesting innovation that's happening in the marketplace where we believe that that's applicable to our business and that they're able to scale with us. And Sandeep, one kind of follow-up question there is from around partnerships. You're, especially like with COVID and some of the, even the new technology advantages, like I imagine your business is changing very quickly, right? And there's going to be new types of technologies that are emergent. The new technologies are going to probably start right in the startup world. And can you maybe talk a little bit about how and when and why you choose to kind of partner with startups and kind of what patterns you've seen that create kind of successful outcomes for you versus, you know, maybe what are traps that other people might step on by mistake? We get a lot of exposure to the startup community. There are probably two or three things that I have taken away from our experience in investments. One is that you really do need a global coverage. What works in APAC and APAC itself, when we say APAC, we try to generalize as if all of APAC is the same. Even APAC is significantly different, right? Or Europe for that matter. But you do need that local nuance of here is what is working in this market. So that global coverage is really important. And so therefore having a pulse on innovation, if you're a global company for the markets that matter is really important. The second thing that we have learned is that we tend to identify startups that we know will be able to scale with us. And even when we identify a startup that is relatively mature, has a proven way of working, and that they, we believe that we can help them scale, they still struggle to scale. So it's really important to do that because if you have some really early stage startup, then that they just are not able to scale. Or especially because we are in the business of serving other large Fortune 500 companies or other large landlords, there are certain requirements that come with it around security and the posture that they expect. And so we typically work with the startup community to then get to that point, but they have to be mature enough. And the third thing that we've been focused on is that let's not chase the shiny object. We always start with what is this critical business need? And then we scan the market for the problem that we are trying to solve for versus the other way around. So Cindy, I'd like to do what we kind of, in a very cheesy way called lightning rounds, right? Basically go through like five, six questions and looking for like kind of the one tweet response. Let's start there. And Sam, do we want to kick it off first? Yeah, absolutely. So maybe to kick us off, Sandeep, how do you think a company should measure the success of a CIO? Yeah, I think in three ways. One is business outcomes. Have they really prioritized what really matters and have they delivered on those business outcomes? Second is the strategic impact, which is really important for a modern technology executive. That are you a trusted advisor to the business? And the third is operational efficiency, which is do you really run an efficient show? And Sandeep, this may be related, but are there common mistakes maybe you see new IT leaders or new CIOs or new CTOs make that you kind of maybe warn people to kind of look out for? Yeah, in my view, a common mistake is that today's technology executive has digital in their titles. My title is Chief Digital and Technology Officer. And there is a reason why digital is there in that title. You're expected to know the business, drive strategy, be a trusted advisor. And in my experience, because the segment stakeholders, the line of business stakeholders don't really know and understand how you execute technology. That's the trade that they value the most. And I feel that a lot of technology executives that are maturing and have grown up in the technology practice have not really honed their digital skills. And that is a really important skill to have. Sandeep, we've talked about a number of exciting projects you've worked on at CBRE or are working on. I'm curious, is there a single technology initiative you've implemented or are implementing in your current role that you're most excited by? I think what I would say is that what we have done with respect to data in our environment, where we had a hypothesis that CBRE is the largest commercial real estate organization, so therefore we would have a data advantage, to a point where breaking down the silos, capturing data from 300 plus data sources, and that being live with 350 plus clients has been a tremendous journey. So maybe to transition to the personal side, what's a recent book you've read that's had a big impact on you and why? So great question. The one that I recently read was from Michael Dell, Play Nice But Win. And it's a really interesting book and reminds you that people perceive success to be this straight line with an upward slope, but it never is a straight line with an upward slope. It's always filled with ups and downs and challenges. 
and it reminded me of the importance of character and tenacity and grit. It was really interesting to read. Okay, maybe one final question. What do you think will be true about technology's future impact in the world that maybe most people feel like would be science fiction today? Oh, that's a tough one. It would be amazing if technology played a critical role. And I do believe that technology has the potential to play a critical role in solving some of the most toughest problems that we are dealing with. And the one that comes to mind is particularly around sustainability and the climate crisis. And because I'm in real estate, I feel like there is such a huge potential for technology to play a role there. And wouldn't that be amazing? Well, Sandeep, thank you so much for joining us today. Really enjoyed chatting with you and hopefully we'll get a chat again soon. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, Sandeep. That was Sandeep Dave, Chief Digital and Technology Officer at CBRE. Thanks for listening to the Enterprise Software Innovators Podcast. I'm Sam Motamidi, a general partner at Greylock Partners. And I'm Evan Reiser, the CEO and founder of Abnormal Security. Please be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find more great lessons from technology leaders and other enterprise software experts at enterprisesoftware.blog. This show is produced by Luke Reiser and Josh Meir. See you next time.